Well, good evening. Uh, my name's Graham Allison. I'm the director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, which is one of the co-sponsors of this forum event this evening. Uh, and I want to welcome you. The topic is the Iranian nuclear challenge. Uh, let me start by reminding you that this is a good time to turn off your cell phones or other things that go uh, beep uh, during the session. Um, as moderator tonight, uh, my job is to introduce our panel, uh, to provide you a brief scene setter, uh, for those of you who don't follow this topic uh, so uh, uh, precisely, uh, and to then pose a series of provocative questions to our panel where we're going to have a conversation here and attempt to get at both points of agreement and points of disagreement. Uh, about 6.45, so a half hour or 40 minutes into the conversation, we're going to go to the floor. There are microphones on the ground floor and on the first loges, so you can be thinking of your questions and uh, be prepared to offer your view or pose a question which we'll entertain. The panel tonight is an outstanding group. Uh, let me say uh, just briefly, you've got in your brochures information about them, but from the left uh, this way from where I'm sitting. Henry Sokolowski is the executive director of the Nonproliferation Policy Education Center, a Washington-based nonprofit organization that promotes better understanding of strategic weapons proliferation for academics and for government. Henry served in the government from 89 to 93 in the Defense Department. He's got a book out called Best of Intentions, America's Campaign Against Strategic Weapons Proliferation. And if you read the Wall Street Journal editorial page, you'll see Henry opining there frequently on this and related topics. Brenda Schaefer, who's in the middle here, is a fellow at the Belfer Center uh, and a scholar who's been looking at issues of Iran for many years. Uh, she's uh, a researcher and policy analyst who's worked for the government of Israel from time to time and is actually back from Israel uh, currently. She's the author of a book called Partners in Need, The Strategic Relationship Between Russia and Iran, and another book that bears on the topic tonight, Borders and Brethren, Iran and the Challenge of Azerbaijani Identity. Ash Carter, my colleague to the left here, is the co-director, well first he's a, the Ford Foundation professor here at the Kennedy School and a long-term member of the Kennedy School faculty. He began life as a physicist, but fortunately is helping uh, those of us who try to cope with the consequences of physics uh, deal with that topic for the more recent period. He's the co-director of the uh, Preventive Defense Project with former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry. It's a Harvard-Stanford project. And Ash was Assistant Secretary of Defense in the Clinton administration dealing with these issues. You'll see a number of his publications referenced in the material as well. So we have a terrific panel. We have one person missing, unfortunately. We invited uh, Iran's ambassador to the US to be here tonight, but he had to be in Europe today. So unfortunately, we don't have uh, the benefit of that perspective. For scene setters, let me mention two points. Uh, first, the topic tonight, Iran's nuclear challenge. There are lots of other good topics about Iran which we're not addressing tonight. Not for the absence of those being worthy topics, but we can't do everything. Most Americans, as I know a number of Iranian uh, and Iranian-American students at the university uh, think, uh, don't know very much about Iran. Iran is a great country that has a distinguished and lengthy history of many millennia. Actually, I first learned about Iran when I was trying to learn Greek as an undergraduate, reading Xenophon's Anabasis about Alexander the Great marching around Persia. Now, that was before you were born, yes, a long time ago. Both, in fact, for most of the students. Iran has a great culture, and in fact, at the Harvard Museums, uh, there's a, a, an excellent collection of, a, of a Iranian artifacts that you can find at a number of the museums. And those of you who pride yourself on knowing about wine probably don't know that the oldest uh, vase containing wine uh, was discovered in northern Iran, a vase that's some 8,000 years old. Okay. 
So again, lots of topics that we're not going to do tonight. Politics in Iran, which is a great topic and will come at the edge. The f son of the Shah of Iran was at the business school a couple of weeks ago, and there was a lively debate about politics in Iran. So there are plenty of topics we're unfortunately not doing tonight. We are doing Iran's nuclear challenge. Now, with respect to that topic, one more point for scene setting. If you've been reading the newspapers lately, you can't pick up the paper any day without finding a front page story, or in any case, a first section story in most of the newspapers about current developments in Iran, where there's a intensification of a complex bargaining negotiation among multi-parties, which continues thickening. If you look at today's New York Times, the front page middle story is by David Sanger, a Harvard graduate, we're happy to say, on uh, the topic or the title of the piece is called Reshaping Nuclear Rules, Bush is Seeking to Close Loopholes in Treaty Allowing Iran and Others to Enrich Uranium. Good piece, I thought. Yeah. Uh, to put you in the picture very briefly, this multi-party negotiations includes at least six major players. Iran, which is currently seeking to complete facilities that will allow it to enrich uranium and reprocess plutonium, asserts that these activities are simply to support their civilian nuclear power plant and industry and entirely for peaceful purposes. Most of the other parties don't accept that assertion. The EU3, these are Britain, France, and Germany, have taken a leadership role in engaging Iran and have been negotiating, negotiating with Iran and have currently reached an agreement with Iran for a temporary, voluntary suspension of all work on Iran's enrichment and reprocessing facilities because they believe that if Iran comes to operate enrichment and reprocessing facilities, it will then be able to build nuclear bombs. This temporary, voluntary suspension has gone on now for about two months where there's been intense negotiation about what carrots Iran is going to get if it extends this moratorium. Israel has declared that an Iranian nuclear weapon is unacceptable in Israeli terms across Israel's national security red line and threatened to bomb Iran before it will allow that to happen. The U.S. has been, oh sorry, Russia uh, has been uh, a, a, in the last two years agreeing that an Iranian nuclear bomb would be a serious problem, has completed the building of a civilian nuclear power plant, a plant like the one here at Pilgrim or a, at Indian Point, so just a civilian nuclear power plant at Bushir, and has recently agreed and entered into a contract with Iran to supply fuel for that power plant and to take the spent fuel back away to Russia after the fuel has been processed by the, uh, by the reactor. The U.S., which in the first term of the Bush administration said that it would first not engage Iran and secondly not provide any incentives for Iran, has done a rather sharp turn in the last several weeks after President Bush's trip to Europe and is now offering some carrots to try to sweeten the package for Iran if Iran will make this temporary suspension of work on enrichment and reprocessing permanent or long term. And these carrots include at this point uh, spare parts for airplanes which were frozen after the Iranian Revolution and secondly dropping objections to Iran's entry into the WTO. Now that's not the whole picture but that's just to remind you that there's a complex multi party bargaining game going on here currently. And what we'll be doing tonight is within that picture, drilling down on some elements of it. The way we're going to proceed tonight is I'm going to start by asking a series of questions to individual members of the panel for a conversation. Where other members of the panel disagree, 
particularly where they disagree, I want to give them a chance to pipe up because we're trying not to have a choir here, but to see, you know, to clarify the issues. And then we'll move to the, to the more general conversation. And let me start with Brenda, uh, if I can, on the question, uh, is Iran seriously seeking nuclear weapons? And if so, why, in your view? Yeah. Graham, I wish it wasn't so, but Iran obviously is running a, a nuclear weapons program. It may, it may decide to get to the nuclear threshold to have the ability to, uh, to produce nuclear weapons, and, and it may make the decision not to test and deploy, but I think basically by Iran's own admission in September 2003, um, when, it, um, when on the eve of its agreement with the, with, the Octo with the EU3, it basically said that for 18 years it's been violating uh, the NPT, it's had a variety of importations that it never reported, that it was running um, you know, an, an additional, uh, additional program into the nuclear energy program. So even by its own admission, we know that they have a nuclear weapons program. They don't call it a nuclear weapons program, but if you have just a nuclear energy program, you don't go buying components from AQCon network. Um, I think there's other places you would buy those, those, import, uh, those components from, and you wouldn't hide the things you're importing if you're having a nuclear energy program. And also, I think if you look at world trends in, in energy, since the 1970s when we had the world energy crisis, one of the biggest developments is the relative decrease in the use of nuclear energy. And why? Because it's expensive. Um, the world is going over to oil and gas, mainly to natural gas. Who's the number two producer in the world of natural gas? Iran. It doesn't even have markets for most of its natural gas. Iran's, Iran flares more gas from, from its oil, oil refineries, flares, just that a waste than, than actually Boucher will produce in, in terms of energy. Um, so it's kind of a hard argument that they're looking for nuclear energy um, when you're such a large producer of, of natural gas. And I think another indication would be the Shihab-3 missile program. These missiles, medium range ballistic missiles, they're not very accurate with the conventional warhead. They can't do much. Not, they're not really worth the money or the investment. You put a non-conventional warhead on them, they're very interesting. I think the developing of this missile program at the same time is also another indication that they are, they're actually developing a warhead at the same time. Okay, so with respect to the first part of the question, is Iran seriously seeking a nuclear bomb? Does everyone on the panel agree the answer is yes? do. Um, and then I, on the question of why, maybe you want to say any comment on that? Uh, yeah, I think everything Brenda has said is absolutely accurate. There's just one thing that, that I would add to what you said, Brenda, which is that um, e even if you think Iran needs to have a, a nuclear power program, uh, the way it's going about it, first through the deceit, but secondly by pursuing enrichment and reprocessing, uh, no one believes that that's the most economical way for them to run a light water reactor program. The most economical way is to get fuel services from outside and repatriate the spent fuel. So the economics aren't there. Uh, another thing I think that's important, we're talking about intentions, Graham, is to kind of say who, whose intentions. Right. And <clears throat> whenever uh, I uh, teach about uh, proliferation, I always try to unpack this. There is the military intention to have nuclear weapons. Then there is another kind of intention, which is about national pride and the feeling that we're entitled to this and not to have it is discriminatory, which reinforces the military rationale. And then in most places, there's also an entrenched, entrenched constituency. Yeah. That is people who have, for, in the case of Iran, 40 years been working on nuclear power. Uh, so it's a hard thing to root out. The other thing we know about Iran uh, which is different from, say, North Korea, where we don't really know. We know that in Iran, the intentions that you're describing are widely shared. This is not the mullahs program. And so if the intergenerational revolution that we all hope and expect takes place in Iran, you can't expect that the people who take power in the next generation are automatically going to say, well, Iran doesn't, have, doesn't need to have nuclear power or nuclear weapons. It appears to be something that is widely shared. That makes it a much tougher problem. Ooh. Uh, my uh, view is colored by my experience uh, as a deputy assistant secretary level official in the Pentagon. In 1990, uh, I ran across intelligence where Iran was covertly trying to acquire heavy water reactors that were just right for making plutonium for bombs. And they didn't just go first and give up. They, they went first to China, then they went to Russia. Then they went to India, then they went to Argentina. And they always covered their tracks. They didn't want anyone to know that they were seeking these, 
these uh, contracts, and they didn't want to have them safeguarded. This was enough for me to think there was a problem right there, and that was 15 years ago. More important, you know, the Shah of Iran in the mid-'70s expressed keen interest. I think that's mine. <laughs> It's probably just as well I don't have it. Okay. I'd probably look at it and start no, saying things. No, no, leave it, things. leave it alone. Go ahead. No cheat sheets. <laughs> I couldn't get it all on my on one hand. Uh, you know, the Shah uh, was the first to get into this uh, desire to get a bomb, and we more or less were willing to let him get it. Uh, Carter approved a big reprocessing transfer, and at that time. Israel, the United States were allies. Pakistan didn't even have a bomb program. So this tells you that there's something more than fear and loathing operating here. There's desire. Uh, this gets to why they want it. Now, the Shah was no longer uh, in power now, but the new crew wants to stay in power. And this bomb project's part of that. They want to show that by going ahead with this program, they can get the kinds of things even the Shah wasn't able to get, which is respect and treatment as an equal by even the superpowers. They also understand that they don't have quite enough money to really become a major conventional military power. But if you have the missiles and you have people wondering whether you have a bomb, that's good enough. And they mean to do business. They'd like to chair OPEC. They'd like to be at the front of the vanguard of the Islamic uh, revolutionary effort throughout the world. They'd like to be respected. They'd like to have tribute paid by their, by their neighbors in forms of investment. I can go on. Okay, so we, 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 this group at least agrees, yes, they're seeking a bomb, and we've got a complex of uh, a model of motives, but in any case, they seem to be yeah. rather strong, and Ash's point is, if there were a regime that changed, it's not obvious that this uh, objective would change. You know, all the polling and so forth, my understanding, here's the expert on Iran, but the, the, the information that I have on Iranian politics is that this is widely shared. Okay, so let me go on to the second question and let me put this to you, to you Ash. Uh, what's so bad about Iran having a nuclear bomb? Let's imagine that next year or the year after, Iran has an arsenal of a few bombs, therefore, What's so bad about that? Okay, uh, good question, and uh, there are actually several answers to that one also. One, they might use them, of course, and they might use them against us, of course, now speaking as the United States, uh, and they have uh, actually, we're not the only enemy they have. They have the historic enemy of Iraq, which we have done the astonishing thing to Iranians of eliminating in the last couple of years. Uh, remember, American policy traditionally in the Gulf was to balance Iran and Iraq. And we've now taken away that counterweight. But at any rate, they haven't forgotten the Iran-Iraq war. Um, they feel encircled now by a Sunni conspiracy. They feel encircled by the Americans. Um, Israel, I think, is a factor, not a, I don't think a huge factor in Iranian uh, thinking. But at any rate, as they look around them, they've got plenty of enemies there. And so use is possible. But it doesn't stop there. Uh, the, if Iran gets the bomb in that part of the world, who's next? to think that, well, look, they got away with it. And, and of course, we have North Korea bubbling today. That's in a different region. But in that region, there are others who have this aspiration. So if you let one domino fall, you really got to wonder where that goes. And then there's another thing, which we all have to remember after 9-11, which is when a government makes this stuff, it, it, I just remind you, the half-life of plutonium is 24,000 years. Of, of uranium-235 uh, is uh, 513 million years. And what that tells you is once this stuff is in humanity's hands, once it's made, it's going to be there through many turns of history's wheel. So who gets it next? Some future government? Is it sold? Is it diverted? I mean, Graham uh, uh, worries a lot about nuclear terrorism. I do too. Rightly, you should. So once this stuff is made, it casts a shadow very far into the future. So there are plenty of reasons to worry about okay. the Iranian nuclear.
nuclear program. Any disagreements? Yes. If I could just follow up Please. on this point here about about the materials, that's why this program has to worry us at this stage, even before they even. I mean, I'm not even sure they've decided to actually test and deploy. But the fact that they could be processing uranium and plutonium, and imagine in a scenario where the regime changes. Imagine after Iraq when we had the looting and we don't and no, no control. Imagine a situation like that in Iran. We have no control over this uranium and plutonium that's being produced. We don't know where it is. Even most of the Iranian government members don't know where that this is. This is a regime within a regime within a regime that controls uh, this program. Can you imagine a situation when, when Hassan Rouhani, the National Security Council chairman, he has to plan his villa in Paraguay. He has to make money for his future, right? And he sells this stuff to terrorist groups. So I don't think it's necessarily the danger of just using the bomb, setting it off on someone, but just the existence of these materials within the hands of a government within a government. If I was an Iranian, I would be concerned about these materials that are being held really mostly in civilian populated areas so that they're less of targets to be bombed. They, cre they create a huge environmental and physical danger to the people of Iran, as much to the people of Iran as to the people of the whole region. Let me, let me get, extend that question to Henry. Yeah, just uh, one more one All these, more all these yeah. things are, are true, uh, I guess. Uh, but the thing that I like to harp on <laughs> is it sets an example. Now, you raised this, Ash, but I think it goes further. You probably all have on your seats a vision of the world. Right now, the world looks pretty manageable. You know, you've got NATO, you've got India, Pakistan, who we've decided to call non-NATO allies, strategic partners. We kind of glossed over this proliferation problem by making everybody a buddy, except China. That's, that's a little bit of a problem. And the world's like a hub. Everything comes back to us. We don't have to worry about all the complexity. If Iran succeeds in getting people convinced that they have a right under the rules to get right up to the edge of having a nuclear arsenal, and if in addition they can withdraw legally like North Korea did with impunity, which North Korea did, you're going to find everybody in the neighborhood emulating this, and you're going to have a, a world full of Irans and North Koreas. And that is a world like nuclear 1914, I like to say. It's a nuclear 1914 scenario where everybody sort of knows who their friends are, but they don't know if they can rely on them. And they sort of know who their enemies are, but they don't really know how dangerous they might be. And in that world, you make mistakes. And those mistakes, much like plutonium, tend to be really big and they last a long time. They're called wars. And those wars can go on for a very long time, except now, unlike nuclear 1914, where you have World War I and II, and about 100 million dead, you, you may have the same period of time, but they're going to be using nuclear ammunition. That's a showstopper for things like these seminars. OK, but let me, let me push on this, and it's really the, the following question. Who, who, who is the US to tell Iran that it can't have a nuclear bomb. I mean, the U.S. has nuclear weapons. Israel has nuclear weapons. So two questions. Yeah. By what right yes. does U.S. say, look, we've decided you, not you. OK, you, OK, not you, you, OK, not you. So first, by what right or standing, first. Right. And secondly, if a state like Iran is determined to get a nuclear bomb, can the U.S. or the, quote, international community, as that's American speak for, us and all the people on behalf of whom we're acting, okay? <laughs> can they prevent it? Yeah. Well, I think the short answer is if you sign up to a program that says you're not going to get the bomb, but you'll get the benefits of peaceful nuclear energy, and you're going to get the assurance of knowing that all of your friends that signed up to this treaty aren't going to get a bomb, you're kind of obligated to follow the rules. Now, that wasn't just the United States that told them to do that. They signed up. It's called the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. So them's the rules. Now, if nobody enforces the rules, you're right. Or if they read the rules in such a way that you can't violate them ever, then you get away with murder. But a non-proliferation treaty shouldn't allow people to get up to a screwdriver's turn from an arsenal. If it is, it's not much of a non-proliferation treaty. As far as uh, you know, determining uh, who gets the bomb, all things being equal, I think it'd be best if there'd be fewer and that nobody, whether it's Iran or South Korea, get it. And, and, and this isn't just the United States that should be deciding this. 
you know, almost everybody signed this treaty except a handful of countries. So, are we serious? What can we do? At the very least, you don't want to encourage bad behavior by turning the other cheek. You sure don't want to make people think that they can break and leave the contract with impunity. You got to set an example of some sort for the others. At a minimum, you have to identify uh, a country like Iran as a violator so they can't de demand being treated like an equal, you know, and, and that we should be the equal of the United States and we should get this and we should get that. No, you're a violator. You're in the penalty box. You're going to have to do something to get out of it. We haven't gotten there, but both with North Korea and Iran, I think at some point we soon we have to do that. And there are a number of ways in which you can do that. But I'll stop there. Well, could we ask you? Yeah, yeah I want to take a whack at that also. I get asked that all the time as, as well. Um, and, you know, nuclear weapons are so, they concentrate destructive power so uh, 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 hideously that, you know, in the long run, nobody ought to have nuclear weapons. We all acknowledge that. These things are not something that ought to be uh, uh, around. And every American president has said that in the long run, in some way, you know, that ought to be an objective of the United States. But reality is that history, that is the immediate post-World War II history, l left nuclear weapons in the hands of the five victors of World War II. That's a residue of, of, of World War II. And like that, not like that, should the French have nuclear weapons? And you can argue about that, but that's where history left us. That doesn't, to me, at all create a presumptive right of anybody else to go down that uh, road. And besides, what the NPT is about, this nonproliferation treaty to which we keep uh, referring, is the have-nots, so-called, saying that notwithstanding that the haves have, we have decided to have not. Now, why have they decided that? Mostly because they want their neighbor to have not. And so even in the region, most of the governments there have decided that on the whole, notwithstanding the Israeli exception, it's better off for them not to have nuclear weapons, as long as everybody else around doesn't have nuclear weapons as well. So that's not an American deal. That's a local understanding that is very congenial to the United States, but makes good sense. And so for one party, Iran, in this particular era in which it's run by a particular kind of government, to disturb that is a threat to the long-term interests of everyone, and it's perfectly reasonable for everyone to turn on them and say, hey, this is not, uh, this is not um, uh, on. Now, you've got to deal with the dignity problem, and I presume we'll get to that when we get to, when we get to uh, uh, prescription, uh, but um, uh, it is not a right of any state in the international system to create a problem for everybody else. It's that simple, and this does that. Okay, so let me push on then to where we are now and what we can do about it. Because I think uh, if you say the Bush administration, at least in the second term, is now certainly engaged with this issue. As President Bush came back from Europe uh, on the plane, Steve Hadley, the Assistant for National Security Affairs, said the President is thinking about carrots and sticks for Iran and from whom. So the game is now intensifying, as I said. So I just said maybe go around the circle and say, do you believe that the current hand that the Bush administration is playing is going to be adequate to successfully prevent Iran finishing its enrichment facility or reprocessing facility? Or if not, what, how does it need to be su supplemented? or substituted for, if you think that it's possible to stop it. Brenda, what do you think? Um, first thing, I wish the Bush administration was playing a hand or had a hand, but I think, I think that there's really no Iran policy for the United States, not on the nuclear issue or not, not on engagement, not on, not on really any issue connected to Iran. I think if one thing that actually unites Democrats and Republicans in the United States is the fact that they both see the Iranian nuclear program a problem and neither of them have a plan on the elections, neither, neither, neither had a plan, both just said it's really bad and it's wrong. Um, so I don't think the current plan will work because there is, there is no plan. Um, I think if there's something that's probably the most talked about between the Europeans and the U.S. as sort of the, the, the most practical solution, it's the grand bargain, um, which would mean that Iran gets to sort of freeze its abilities where they are now. It, it stops um, processing uranium. It doesn't move, move forward. And Iran gets to stay, this regime gets to stay in power uh, without, without the U.S. trying to undermine it, without the U.S. supporting the reformists. And I think 
that this is not without consequence. I mean, I think it's something that, um, yes, it may address the nuclear issue, but think about it. Um, we cheer the U.S. government, whoever's in government, when they support protesters in Georgia, when they, pr pr they support protesters in the streets of the Ukraine. We think that's a good thing. But when we talk about supporting a reform movement in Iran, they're called war, we call ourselves warmongers, militarists, regime changers. Um, why, why is reform in Iran less something, something less to be celebrated than in Georgia or in, or in Ukraine? Um, so I think, we have to, I, think, I think every Iranian and every American who cares about the future of Iran has to realize that if we go for the grand bargain, probably it's the best way to deal with the nuclear question, but it probably is the thing that will actually freeze this regime in power and, and the hope of reform without it being some kind of really violent uh, overthrow in, in, in the long-term long future. Um, and actually puts us in that place where we're looking at ourselves today after we've supported very corrupt autocratic regimes in the Middle East and saying, how did, how did we do this? How did we end up you know, in partnership with really with very unpopular uh, sort of bad, bad regimes? In the end, if we, if we make the grand bargain, it sounds rational, but in the end, we're going to put ourselves in bed, in bed with the mullahs, if pardon the expression. Yes, what do you think? I, I think Brenda's right. We don't really have a strategy, and that's a bipartisan fault, failing <laughs> going back 30 years in the United States, and it goes back to the Iranian hostage yeah. uh, taking. That went very deep. I remember Warren Christopher, uh, with whom I worked in the uh, Clinton administration, used to say, we're not going to sell Iran a Kleenex. He was very famous for that line, a Kleenex. <laughs> he was the Deputy Secretary of State when the hostages were taken, and nothing offends a diplomat like the taking of diplomats hostage, and it just went very deep. And what that meant was that anybody in the U.S. government of either party over decades who said, you know, we probably ought to get in the game over there in some way with this country, whatever we think of it. Uh, that was a, a career-ending aspiration. And so we haven't been in the game. You might ask, Graham, why are we using diplomacy at all? And one of the other stories in the newspaper, I think it was today, uh, was, it was the London Times today, was about the military option. So why don't we just say, well, let's do what uh, for the, those of you in the audience who know me know I was involved in 1994 in the planning of the airstrike on Yongbyon in North Korea. Now, there was a situation where in one night we could have ended, set back the North Korean nuclear program very decisively because it was concentrated in certain facilities. They were above ground. We knew exactly where they were, and we thought that we could destroy that reactor and entomb the plutonium in one night all by ourselves in a way that would not create any radiological contamination and so forth. Something that clean is not available in the case of Iran. And you have to start there for those who have gotten into the habit of thinking about military uh, solutions. Moreover, were you to do something that didn't have that decisive effect, you'd probably make it much harder for a successor government to the Mullah government to control this, this impulse, which as I said is widely shared. That would annoy to put it mildly, Iranians of all stripes for a long time were we to do that. So we're trying to avoid that if we possibly can. That leads to diplomacy. What can the goal of diplomacy be at this point, Graham? I don't think that we're going to extirpate anytime soon this desire. Uh, so, the bet, so what you're really talking about is trying to hold the problem off until another day comes when we have a different kind of relationship, they have a different kind of government, and a people that says, you know, on the whole, we have other fish to fry than nuclear weapons and nuclear power. We want to be on the internet, we want to have lattes, we want to have investment and trade, and we're not going to get that if we go nuclear. So on the whole, it's not worth going nuclear. And you've got to delay things until then. That's probably the best you can hope for. And if you want to put a, a, a favorable light on what the Europeans are doing, which I don't think will ever go anywhere, towards eliminating the program, the best light you can put on it is it's a stalling tactic. And then maybe, you know, some years from now, if we just get a, keep them away from the line, it'll be a different climate and we'll have a different strategy, a better strategy, and we, we can okay, make some but a, but a multi-year stall, so if, 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 <laughs> five, years, of all if five years from now Iran has no nuclear bomb, that might be called some it's a pretty good of deal. a success. I don't know. Good Henry, good what do you uh, think? I want my money back. <laughs> uh, I'm not signing up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think there is a moral hazard, but it isn't just one moral hazard. There, there are at least two. I mean, we've heard about one. I think Brenda did a pretty good job of indicating that there are risks from a political standpoint. Now, if it was the case that you take those risks, but you get clear benefits for nonproliferation, okay, you know, maybe you'd hold your nose. 
But I think the second moral hazard you run, it's, it's politically incorrect, you're probably rewarding a proliferator. You certainly are not doing anything to set up the rules so the others won't follow. And I think what you'll end up doing is not really buying them off. At most, you might rent the appearance for a while. And, and the second thing you do is you encourage everybody in the neighborhood to want to get one. Uh, I would say that the Bush uh, approach really is driven not so much to reach out to Iran, but to reach out to, to Brussels and in particular to the European Three. We do not want to be blamed for the failure of their talks. We do not want Iran to succeed in its strategy of splitting us off from our allies. Now, that is not enough. As you say, that is not a complete strategy. You have to have a deadline. And with all due respect, it can't be you know, years away. It can't even be many months away. There's an election in June. You know, okay, the Europeans aren't going to do anything until after the election, but boy, it better come pretty darn soon after that. that you, an election you, in Iran, yeah. An election in Iran, and, and you've got to say, okay, you've got to forswear and you've got to terminate the bulk handling facility activity, particularly the enrichment right now. And you've also got to start articulating now in the UN and at Harvard and down in Washington what the rules ought to be for everybody. Why is it that we don't want them to enrich? If indeed they think they have a right and people say that it can be safeguarded to prevent it from ever being diverted and make bombs, what's the problem? Well, the problem is they don't have a right and it can't be safeguarded. But guess what we haven't said or articulated as an argument publicly? Those two points. We better get on with it and quickly. And I think finally what we need to do is we need to have a real effort, and here's where Harvard can help. Let's get some strategies. You flatter to... us. But... <laughs> but we'll agree. Well, you didn't pay for it. He hadn't told us what it is yet. <laughs> uh, it's good Maybe point. by being very quiet. Yes. <laughs> That's right. I'm all ears. We need to have real hard-headed uh, strategies <laughs> to leverage both negatively and positively China and Russia with regard to the country neutral propositions that will just happen to apply very country specifically to North Korea and Iran. You know, I just went to a hearing and I gave testimony about China and North Korea and you know, everybody's saying, well, you can't do anything with the Chinese. There's no way to leverage them and oh, it's just terrible. You know, I pointed out to them, I said, you know, there are only two countries that sell a product that China wants in the way of a nuclear reactor. It's not the Russians. It's the French and the Americans. We're paying tons of money as citizens to put these designs into the hands of the Chinese without even asking them, would you like to sign up to a couple of propositions before we go ahead with a sale? Those propositions that make sense happen to be uh, ones that the French themselves have proposed in their own policies. You mean we can't go to the French and say, hey, let's hold off for a couple of weeks and talk to the Chinese? We need more options like that. I, I don't want to keep going, but there are okay, options so let, there. Let me, let me see, because I, I'm still now, I thought I understood where people were, but now I'm slightly confused. Okay. Dr. Rice, here she is, okay, she says, I want to know what I should attempt to accomplish in the second term of the Bush administration that could be accomplished and how I can do that. Now, Brenda would say, well, if all you do is make a deal with them, and I, I, let me say about my own view, I believe that the Bush administration under Dr. Rice is actually now engaging, and I think they are composing a grand bargain for denuclearization. I don't know whether they're going to succeed or fail, but they're trying to see who's going to bring what carrots and sticks to the table. And their hope, I believe, is to get Iran to stop all work, to take the current temporary voluntary suspension and make it, quote, permanent or long term. And they're going to regard that as at least no nuclear bombs on their watch. And I'm going to cheer if that happens, because I think otherwise Iran might actually acquire a nuclear bomb. But it will have all of the negative consequences that Brenda suggested, namely, they'll have dealt with the Americans, we will have dealt with them, 
Maybe we'll do it at least at arm's length and let the Europeans, you know, do the payola so we can have a little bit of principle. But the, 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 uh, the fact will be that we'll be supporting the regime. Now, that seems to me like an approach. It's not a permanent solution. They're not going to give up their desire, but that seems to me like we don't have any recipe for that. So that if, if I listen to Ash, that's too hard. So no, 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 is no, that no. there's... That, no, 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 that's where, that's where yeah. I am. That's what I mean. That's stalling the program. That's right. It's not extra. But you said it's giving... But you said finding a solvent that will wash this desire out of Iran from your earlier conversation sounded to me like a solvent that you hadn't no, discovered no, that, yet. That's yes. not going to happen. So you're right. talking about a stalling strategy. Right. Stalling is valuable when it comes to nuclear weapons. It's the difference between none and some. Well, And so what's wrong with that? I mean, I would right. say that's where they're going. What's wrong with that? And if that's, if that's not yeah. the right one, if you were saying to, to Condi Weiss, don't do that, don't do, do this. Yeah? Don't, don't do that. Okay, do what? The, you need to make sure that you don't set an example for the others okay, that you no, get rewarded. But that's rewarded. still don't. What do I do? Yeah. Well, and what you do is you set a deadline and you run the risk that they might not meet it. There is something worse than an Iran with nuclear potential, and that is a neighborhood full of nuclear potential. Right. That's the big prize. If you can get Iran not to deploy, you want that too, and I think you can have both. And the way you do it is you set the rule, you set the deadline, you explain it. If they fail, you identify them as a violator. You take whatever actions that will stigmatize them so the others won't follow. And then you make it very clear to them in a variety of other actions with or without the UN that going ahead for deployment will be not worth the candle. At that point, you got to hope one thing. You know, there usually takes a long time before people know whether someone has nuclear weapons. It's not like, uh, I mean, in the old days, I remember you used to have a turkey, and there was a little pop-up valve when it was ready, and you see that thing pop up, and oh, it's ready. You don't have one of those for most nuclear programs other than nuclear testing. And it turns out if you talk to an Israeli, or if you talk to a North Korean, it was about 15 years before people were convinced they had nuclear weapons, even after they deployed. You better hope that you have a lot of political activity in those 15 years so the regime is different and that they haven't deployed and that you're able to work that. But I would say, so Henry, if I, let me just make sure I can hear. So yeah, okay. you would set a deadline. When is the deadline? Soon. Soon. So <laughs> after June, but before December. Yeah. Okay, no, I don't care. I'm just yeah, getting something okay. like that. So they set the deadline, and the deadline says by now. By that deadline, you have to do what? Forswear that you will terminate. So you stand up and say, I forswear. Yes. Okay. And then you have to actually terminate right. all work on the enrichment and reprocessing. Right. And for that, you get the package that's coming together. Yes? For that, you don't get identified as a violator. No, but the, the Europeans are going to pay what they're going to pay, as well, they've said. You can't control Europeans. Right. Okay, I mean, I'm just they, trying to. I'm just trying to understand. To trade. Oh, sorry, I'm not trying to, yeah. to critique. I'm just yes. trying to see what well, it is. Understood. Okay, and now if they fail to do that, so comes the deadline and right. they fail to meet it, then you're not going to bomb them. No. No, but I and think you're going to you, encourage you have... the Israelis to bomb them or not? No. No. I, I, okay. I, stop with the bombing. Uh, well, I'm trying to see what you are going to do. It seems to me that that we had a competition with someone that was much more fiercely armed than Iran, uh, and we won it without waging hot war. This should be manageable. It requires long-term diplomacy and a lot of military activities that don't involve overt bombing. It may involve sea exercises to keep the sea lanes open. It can involve a lot of things. It's, it's, it's like a big project at Harvard and Washington for like 10, 15 years. That's fine. Competition. Cold you know as you said, this. went on for a long time. Yeah. And so, Ash, do, let me just see, agree or disagree, and then we're going to go to the audience. I, I'm not yes. sure. I can't tell because I think what Henry's saying is that uh, uh, you set this deadline, and then, well, what happens after the deadline? And, and I think there's a definite what happens after the deadline, which is not bombing, which is sanctions. Yes, well, I would agree. Uh, and, and sanctions may or may not be effective, and you may have to go through. I want to get back to what Henry said about rewarding proliferators. I think that's an important point, and I think 
moreover, any effective diplomacy with anyone, including the Iranians, has to have a carrot side and a stick side. So I don't think anybody is talking about just giving them something for good behavior. I think there has to be an implied penalty for bad behavior uh, as well. Uh, we've talked about the military side, which is not promising but can't be ruled out, shouldn't be ruled out. The, um, but the, the, the real thing that everybody's talking about is if, if, the, if the, the Iranians prove intransigent, they won't get across whatever goalpost we set, whether that's renunciation or something softer. By a certain time, we're going to go to, to um, sanctions. That's a, that's a real penalty for the Iranian government. Now, I don't know if that'll be effective uh, either, but we may need to go through that phase. Okay, let me drill down on that one one second for sanctions, just, and then this is the last question before we go there. They, I hear this as the game plan. So we get the I Europeans. Think that's the Bush administration oh, okay. game plan, by the way. Well, I hear the words, but I don't know what it means. Okay, so it says we're going to refer them to the Security Council, uh -huh. and then the Security Council is going to impose sanctions. So now I'm asking myself, what sanction could the Security Council agree to that would be harmful to Iran? Because if I'm an Iranian, I'm thinking, I bet they're going to cut off our shipments of oil. And I think, oh, wait a minute, what is the price of oil? $52. They're going to cut off oil? Forget it. They're not going to do that. Okay? Well, next, gas. They're going to cut off gas? I don't think so. Okay, so forget it. Now, they're going to tell us we're a bad boy. You know, maybe make words. Okay, I can live with that. Okay. So, what is the sanction that you might imagine France and China voting for in the Security Council that would be harmful to an Iranian that he or she would fear? Okay. Go ahead. Okay. I think the bad boy label is something there is sensitivity to in Iran. I think the Iranian people want to be a part of the international economy, science. Look how many probably Iranian students we have here, here at Harvard. And I think I think being being declared a proliferator, being declared, um, you know, by a united group of countries. I mean, there is a reason that you know in October two thousand and three, with the with the sort of the fear of the Security Council over their head, that they did make some sort of agreement. Granted, they violated. Granted, they had no transparency in what they reported to the Europeans, but they wanted to do everything possible um, to, pre to prevent it getting to the Security Council. Um, and they've continued to make sure it didn't get to the Security Council. I think that I think there's a big group of people in Iran um, that actually, they, they could be mobilized, Iranian citizens, to realize that this program for the, for the regime within the regime within the regime to have nuclear weapons is more of a danger to them than it is to, to other people. And again, the question is, you know, when we look at this whole sort of nationalist issue, you know, why shouldn't we have, why shouldn't we have a right, right? But the question I think Iranians should ask themselves, do you want these, this group of people to have them? Not do you want sort of an organized democratic government that, that you have some sort of control over, but do you want this regime to have nuclear weapons? And you know what, what will be the future? How will these people give up power when they actually have that fissile materials in their hand? And I think if we discuss any grand bargain, if we do go on that option, um, part of the grand bargain should make sure that fissile materials, there's complete transparency. Because again, I think we should be just as concerned about the implications for nuclear terrorism, an issue mm -hmm. I think you know a lot about, um, more than we are than the actual the, the nuclear bomb. Okay, on oh. sanctions, I'll let you all say what you want to say, but let me encourage the audience. The microphones are here on the ground floor, okay. and in the loges, just line up and please, okay. Ash and Henry. Yep. All right. Uh, on, I think I, there's. Can I come back? Please. Why don't you go ahead? Deadline Ash. business. Yeah. Because I, I think the, I think the problem with the deadline, Henry, is the one that uh, Graham and Brenda point out, and that you actually pointed out yourself when you talked about where the Chinese are on this issue and so forth, which is. That if you're gonna if you're gonna take that route, you got to prepare the battlefield, as they say. And uh, in six months, we will go to the Security Council, and I, my prediction is that we will be the only ones in favor of sanctions, and we'll get cut down the Security Council. So that's not a that's not a smart strategy. If that's your strategy, you're not going to succeed. I'm concerned. Therefore, if you take that route, we will do we will do uh, we'll we'll create a cloud of dust and we'll have a take a stand, but we, we won't be effective and we'll end up where you were and I want to pursue some